Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today we will discuss a very common situation that you will encounter during your practice and that is a patient walking in your clinic with a complaint of their crown being dislodged frequently. Most often this happens in cases where there is inadequate occlusal cervical height or a short clinical crown height. So what can we do to prevent this? This video is the answer to that question and it talks about the techniques that you can use in your practice successfully to improve the retention of the crown on the tooth and prevent it from being dislodged. First, what is considered as a short clinical crown height? When we talk about short clinical crown, it is the occlusal cervical height that we are taking into consideration. So if you have a tooth with less than 2 mm of sound opposing parallel walls remaining after occlusal and axial reduction, that can be considered as a short abutment or a short clinical crown. There are many factors which alter the occlusal cervical height of the abutment teeth. It could be because of extensive caries, fracture involving the enamel and dentine, attrition, abrasion and erosion of teeth or a developmental anomaly as well. When you take a look at this picture, what do you see? Inadequate occlusal cervical height. Right? So now, if you end up placing a crown on this, how long do you think it will last? The retention in the resistance form is obviously compromised in this case. So what can be done? First option that we will discuss is subgingival margin. You can attempt to increase the length of the tooth by placing a subgingival margin. But you need to take care that you don't go too deep below the gingival margin or you will end up violating the biologic width. In this video, I will discuss very briefly what biologic width is. In simple terms, biologic width is the combined height of connective tissue and the epithelial attachment of the tooth above the alveolar crest. So when you are preparing a margin subgingivally, you have to make sure that you don't encroach upon this area. For example, if your sulcus depth is 1.5 mm, place your margin only 0.5 to 0.7 mm subgingivally. So you are on the safe side. What will happen if you violate the biologic width? It will damage your periodontal tissues causing inflammation, gingival recession and bone loss. I hope you have understood this concept. I will try to cover it in depth in another video, especially on the relation of biologic width and tooth restoration. Next option we have is the crown lengthening procedure. Now crown lengthening is basically exposing the cervical part of the tooth that is buried under the gingiva, increasing the length of the tooth. This can be done by a simple gingivectomy using a scalpel, laser or cautery if there is sufficient sulcular depth. However, if the sulcus is shallow, which is the scenario in most cases, you have to reflect the flap followed by osseous recontouring. There are two things that you need to keep in mind when you opt for this. One is the crown root ratio. Make sure that there is at least minimum crown to root ratio of 1 is to 1 because any less than that will drastically reduce the prognosis of the tooth. Another thing that you need to remember, especially in the aesthetic zone, is the gingival architecture of the adjacent teeth. You wouldn't want the gingival zenith of one tooth higher than the other. It wouldn't be very pleasing. Coming to the next point, that is improving the retention and resistance form of the tooth. How can you do that? One is obviously by placing grooves. For a crown, the grooves should be placed on the proximal aspect, that is the mesial and distal surfaces, as it is more prone to dislodgement along the buccolingual direction. In case you are giving a bridge, you will have to place the grooves on the buccal and lingual surface of the tooth, because here the tipping forces mainly act on the mesial and distal aspect. So all you have to do is take a straight burr, keep it parallel to the tooth surface that you are preparing and create a groove of at least 1 mm in depth and width. Also, your groove should be placed 1 mm above the gingival margin. Another very important feature is to keep the walls as parallel as possible in these cases. You don't want to increase the taper here. Next, let us discuss the best type of crown to give in such cases. The commonly used crowns are metal, PFM, zirconia and lithium disilicate. One thing that you have to remember is that there is absolutely no way that you can give a PFM or a PFZ or any other layered crown. Why? Because these crowns have multiple layers. For example, a PFM has a metal and a porcelain. Therefore, it requires more preparation. So, a monolithic crown, whether it is a zirconia, lithium disilicate or even a metal, 
should be preferred in such patients. If the patient wants a more economical option, you can suggest a DMLS metal crown. With the CAD CAM fabricated milled or laser center technology, you are eliminating the potential for casting errors and the fit of these crowns is definitely more superior than conventional ones. Now coming to the choice of luting cement. Before cementation of a metal or zirconia crown, you can even sandblast the intaglio surface of the crown with 50 microns aluminum oxide particles. All you need to do is instruct your lab technician to do it before he delivers a prosthesis to you. And among the luting cement, resin modified GIC or a resin cement should be used because these have proven to work very well in such cases. Whenever choosing a looting agent, please go for a very good brand like GC or uh, 3M because that also, in my experience, makes a lot of difference. Coming to the last option that we have, orthodontic extrusion of teeth or forced eruption. This involves intentional coronal displacement of the tooth. Along with it comes the bone, connective tissue, epithelial attachment and the gingiva. This technique helps in conserving the bone, it preserves the biologic width and it results in a more favorable crown root ratio. But in spite of all these advantages, the only reason it remains unpopular is because it requires at least 6 to 12 weeks for you to be able to proceed with the final crown. And with this, we come to an end. Try to apply a combination of all the above techniques in your practice and I am sure your patient will not come back with a dislodged crown. These techniques have worked wonderfully for me over the years. I feel increasing the length of the crown is the most important step, either by placing subgingival margins or by crown lengthening. This in combination with grooves, parallel walls, use of RMGIC has always worked very well for me. The crown that I usually suggest for these patients is a zirconia and if they are looking for a more economical option then a DMLS metal crown. Apply these techniques in your everyday practice. I assure you it will be very rewarding. I hope you have benefited from this video. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel. I promise you I will make dentistry a lot easier and fun for you.